Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for such a nice introduction. My name is Dr. Greta Pichivita, and I'm mainly based in London, United Kingdom. Uh, we actually have quite a lot of experience with hyaluronic acid fillers for penile enhancement at our clinic in Harvard Street. And it's a pleasure to present this still quite not so much known topic. So first of all, what is dermal filler? It is a substance injectable into or underneath the skin, soft tissues, for volumization, contouring, reshaping, and also rejuvenation of the soft tissues, or also improving and changing, altering aesthetically body parts proportions, disregarding the body part. So what are the characteristics of the ideal filler? As FDA suggests, ideal filler should have some certain characteristics, including non-allergic, non-toxic, non-teratogenic, non-cancerogenic. Uh, also, the filler should be biodegradable, biocompatible. It should be quite easily injected, easily stored. And at the same time, it shouldn't cause some <coughs> overt uh, skin changes, and it should be quite a long-term volumization if needed. So there are various different fillers. First of all, there are permanent and non-permanent. They differ also in regards to the uh, composition, like hyaluronic acid fillers, uh, polylactic acid fillers, PMMA, um, and there are some other ones as well, as we may know. So the first reported procedure of soft tissue volumization was actually recorded in 1893 as a fat transplantation. It has evolved since then, and a lot of different substances and techniques emerged, <coughs> and new hyaluronic acid products eliminated the necessity for using some uh, precautions such as allergy testing, and in general eliminated some uh, more complex, high-risk techniques, and also some not such compatible fillers in 2003. So, as we know, hyaluronic acid is a naturally occurring substance, and generally speaking, it is a large liner polysaccharide. In the other words, some kind of body sugar uh, formed of repeated diglucuronic acid and also an acetyl glucosamine uh, disaccharide units, which form a linear polymer. Uh, and that each monomer has an approximate molecular weight of 400 daltons. Hyaluronic acid naturally is the main component of the extracellular matrix, and keratinocytes as well as fibroblasts are the main in charge of hyaluronic acid uh, and its production. Uh, it's also uh, important to know that hyaluronic acid uh, may be found in various different tissues and a lot of different cells uh, are also making contribution to its production. So hyaluronic acid, as WHO uh, defines, is a part uh, uh, of biologicals or biologics, which is also a class of medicines uh, that are synthesized uh, as being obtained from a large-scale cell cultures, either animal-based, bacterial, yeast, plant-based cultures. It may also be some different, uh, <coughs> different substances widely used in medicine, such as immune modulators, monoclonal antibodies. So hyaluronic acid uh, and collagen were also examples of these biologics. How we are not regulated as such, because we are classified as medical devices. 
the essential structure of hyaluronic acid remains consistent disregarding the source of hyaluronic acid, whether it's animal or bacterial base. However, the length of the hyaluronic acid change can vary. And as we know, the most uh, of the commercially available hyaluronic acid fillers were typically sourced from avian sources or they have a bacterial origin. So as I have mentioned earlier, uh, the injectable fillers, dermal fillers, were actually regulated and they are classified as medical device and they should be CE marked in Europe and they should be FDA approved in the United States of America. Obviously, some other regions, such as here, uh, they also apply kind of the same rules. And as per my knowledge, the fillers here, they have to be, generally speaking, FDA approved. And in regards to that, it's easy to check. It is a special database of all the FDA approved uh, fillers, which may also differ from the list uh, available in the UK with different marking. But regardless, the fillers in both uh, Europe and also United States of America, they are classified, categorized as class free medical devices. And they are not obtained by the prescription. So we are not medicine. <coughs> However, according to the DB Health uh, Authority, there are some other, I would say, even more advanced regulations, internal guidances that uh, classify botrops and dermal fillers as a prescription-only medicine, and that mainly makes everything a bit more safer for the patients in my eyes. And also, it's very well defined who should perform the procedures with botulinum toxin and dermal fillers here in uh, Dubai. And that should be administered only by the trained and privileged licensed physicians, uh, such as dermatologists, plastic surgeons, GPs who have a certain training and qualifications, or other physicians, if they are consultant or specialist level, and if it is within their field, within their expertise. Now I'd like to speak about something not less important, about rheological properties of hyaluronic acid fillers. Rheology is a branch of physics which studies how the materials, such as hyaluronic acid gels, react, either flow or get deformed uh, in the background of some kind of uh, applied forces. And there are a lot of rheological terms that should be really well known by aestheticians or anyone working with the dermal fillers. Uh, so, I think the most well-discussed uh, rheological uh, term is elastic modulus, or G prime, and this defines how the material such a filler uh, is easily deformed in the presence, or its shape is altered in the presence of an applied force. So, the higher the value is, the firmer the filler can be, the, well it keeps the, uh, the better it keeps the shape, the better it keeps the structure and more support you have from that filler, yes? Then there is another uh, viscous modulus or G double prime, and this one defines how much viscosity is within the filler. So the higher the value is, more viscosity the filler has. <coughs> and this, uh, this is also very important, very important property when you think about the clinical application of the filler. There is also complex viscosity, which defines how the filler reacts to the uh, when, when the shear force uh, is applied.
So all the stereological properties were very well defined in the literature and we can find it easily. Uh, and talking about the penal growth enhancement we have fillers, we know that as in contrary to cosmetic gynecology, there are no dermal fillers with the indication for penile growth enhancement for male, um, male intimate area usage. So we use the fillers as off-label, yes? So when we use that kind of fillers, we really need to understand all these rheological terms and different properties. And for example, in this way, we see that, let's say, I have no conflicts of interest, no bias, but let's say talking about Juvederm Volex, when we look at G prime, yes, it's 665, and Juvederm Ultra 3, Smile, G prime is almost three times less. So that means the Juvederm Volex, it's a much firmer filler, it keeps the shape better, and it resists the deformity better. So it, it's first of all can be used for more support, yes? And it will give also more volumization. Also talking about G double prime, yes, viscosity factor. Uh, we also see that Juvederm Volux is 49 and Juvederm Smile is 71. So again, talking about viscosity, we understand that uh, more viscous properties are within the Juvederm smile yes so this is quite important if we use the filler off label as it's not so easy uh, to find it all in any kind of information leaflets or any kind of guidelines where and which filler you should use more in regards to those uh, off label off label indications yes so as we say different manufacturing procedures provide means to alter hyaluronic acid concentration cross-linking degree, reabsorption, biophysical and rheological characteristics to ultimately fit different clinical indications. And that's really important. So not all the fillers are really the same. And the clinicians, they have uh, to tailor the choice according to the treatment we are providing, according to the uh, anatomical differences, individualized differences in a certain patient and also the expectations. And it's so not standardized in the case of cosmetic andrology and non-surgical treatments. We don't really have any proper guidelines. There is really little scientific evidence and it's not easy to be, uh, to be guided and uh, it's not easy to understand what's wrong or what's right if you do not have a certain knowledge. So this is just an example how in facial aesthetics, you know, uh, you, you, can, you can apply this, this knowledge and you can see that different, uh, different uh, rheological properties fillers they are being applied for different treatments to different areas to inject into different kind of soft tissues. Yes. So generally speaking, uh, the fillers are similar, uh, but the longevity is also something important to be considered. And there is non-cross-linked hyaluronic acid, which doesn't give a, a high longevity for volumization. However, nowadays, there are a lot of different uh, techniques, mainly to increase the longevity. This is a very good um, this is a very good publication from 2010 which I recommend to read in regards uh, to the overview of the do's and don'ts of the filler because disregarding the application they are generally speaking the same. And in regards to the contraindications, so to find the right patient is very important and to select the right patient is crucial, yes? So here you can see absolute and relative contraindications uh, for penile birth enhancement exclusively. Obviously, there are some minor or some more major complications that 
are a bit different from the other fields of aesthetics where we use dermal fillers. However, the general complications remain the same and the, uh, the proportions uh, are basic for all the, all the aesthetic procedures in for, uh, involving the fillers. So these are my references. And I would be happy to answer your questions in the end of the session.